Alright, uh, we were going to have a few more than just these two this week, but um, my week got a lot busier than I had expected, so uh, I, we just have these two. But we'll get some more uh, Midnight Special. I finally get to see Midnight Special next week, and I'm really excited about it, and that'll be on the next video. It's a packed well, video. As well as um, uh, the other three. Whatever they are. Uh, Keanu is there. Uh, Keanu, yeah, Ratchet, we'll and Clank, and Mo Mother's Day. Yeah, this is what we do at the end of the video, usually. But right. We're going to start now. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're going to start with uh, The Huntsman, Winter's War. Remember when Snow White and the Huntsman came out in 2012, and we all went crazy for it? <laughs> I don't remember. I was, I was telling you on the way down, I really hope we don't have to remember the first one, because I, I don't. I remember very, very little. Um, uh, Charlie's coming out of gold. I remember that. So, <laughs> so, um, basically, the beginning of it is, I don't know if he's credited or not, or if that even was him, or if I was just hearing things, but I'm pretty sure the narrator's Liam Neeson. That's who it sounds like. <laughs> There's no way that couldn't be him. And should that be him, the opening of the movie is Liam Neeson telling us the story of Frozen. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's been brought up multiple times now, but there's no way to just not acknowledge that the, um, the Emily Blunt portion of this movie is fucking Frozen. It's Frozen by way of Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> I know. Uh, so anyway... Uh, Uncredited. Who, Liam Neeson? Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, I don't know why they, I don't know why he goes on credit. It's not like we don't know it's him. Yeah, no lie. <laughs> His <laughs> voice is unmistakable. Well, Rob Bryant's in this movie, so maybe it could have been like a genius in, uh, imitator or something. Okay. Anyway. Um, so as you can probably imagine, for some reason, Universal thought that out of, um, Kristen Stewart playing Snow White... And Charlie's playing the evil queen, and we got wicked gold mirror guy, um, and we have all the dwarves. Like it was, it was Bob Hoskins' last movie, yeah. and then there was like Nick Frost, and there and Rob Brydon, and obviously four others at least. Um, who n in that movie needed a spinoff movie? Well, I'll tell you who. Um, even though I have uh, complimented Chris Hemsworth in the past for his charisma and that I like what he's able to bring to a movie, um, even if he's not necessarily, you know, the greatest actor, per se, um, the most damn forgettable character in that movie they thought needed his own movie. I don't remember a single damn thing he did in the first movie. I'm trying to cash in on I this. I have no record. The trailer shot. The trailer shot of him doing this is all I remember about him in the first movie. It's better than me. I don't even remember that. And he's the one that gets the spinoff. That's great. I don't even know what his position was at the end of the movie. Nope. <laughs> I, remember, I remember her getting, like, crowned. Um, and yet, oh my god, do they dance around the fact that Kristen Stewart's not in this movie. <laughs> Big time. Oh, man. They, they wanted this director to stay with his wife. That's what it was. <laughs> um, no, I don't even know if this director's married. Come on. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm sorry for that cheap shot. But, continuing on, um, he's basically, uh, Emily Blunt is making an army of huntsmen, and we see young Hemsworth. So this is before the events of Snow White and the Huntsman. And obviously, um, Emily Blunt and Charlize are sisters. And then something bad happens, and then Emily Blunt turns into, um, was it Elsa? Was she the icy one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's who she turns into. And then he meets, uh, uh, the Huntsman meets Jessica Chastain. And they fall in love, and they get married, and then she supposedly dies. And then he goes off and he does his own thing, and then, yeah, it's, it's basically, I guess it's frozen from then on. Um, I don't know what, uh, okay, well, first off, uh, before we do anything, um, if you're curious about Jessica Chastain in this movie, um, she is Colin Farrell's bullseye from Daredevil. 
Um, <laughs> Down to everything. <laughs> it, Jessica Chastain's catchphrase in this movie is, I never miss. She even says it in the same tone. She does. <laughs> as Colin Farrell. And, as if she's not already just like one character, um, we needed another movie aimed at a younger audience that has a hero in it that uses a bow and arrow. Because there just aren't enough of those yet. <laughs> we just need to keep going. And um, and it's kind of funny that the first movie came out in lieu of uh, uh, the first Hunger Games. So yeah, there is uh, I mean I mean there's I mean there's Cadmus, but there's also Hawkeye, and there's the the what was it? it's a DC show I think Arrow. Arrow. <laughs> um. So yes, and we are introduced to Hemsworth, and I'm thinking, well, he's got to really really bring that charisma now if they went out of their way to make a two-hour movie to spin off his character, despite the fact that this movie is absolutely 100% about the fucking witches. Oh, yeah. Uh, if that's, I, I guess that's what their technical name is. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot going on. Um, I'm really not quite sure. Maybe, I got so damn bored with the narration, because this, this, this is one of those movies where the narration just kind of keeps going. For a while, I thought the movie was going to turn into Casino. When De Niro's narration is literally the first hour of the movie. Which in Casino is fine. Right. But but here, I was like, is he still talking? When is this movie going to start? <laughs> um, I wish I had been able to clock exactly how long we were in before, when he finally stopped. But it's like he just kept coming back. And it was like, is, are we at an official start point yet? Or are we still doing backstory? Because the whole, well, obviously, as you can see, it's like you were pointing out, somebody said to you that it was um, the, the second 300 movie. Right. Where it's like, it's a little bit of a prequel and a little bit of a sequel, and sometimes it's ha sometimes they're happening simultaneously. Um, just to be extra confusing. <laughs> Very true. Um, so I, I'm thinking, you know, Hemsworth, you gotta really, really bring yourself into this and really make sure that people remember that the movie's called The Huntsman and not... Um, the Bickering Sisters. <laughs> so, we get this big dramatic reveal of young, a young huntsman who looks absolutely nothing like Chris Hemsworth, um, beating the shit out of a straw dude, a dude made out of straw with his axe, and the big reveal of Hemsworth is a straw dude getting cut up. You're really showing how fucking tough this guy is. He beat the fuck out of a scarecrow with an axe. <laughs> Badass. <laughs> um, but anyway, they kind of play it up like the moment in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter when he um, chops uh, the tree in half and it just fucking flies in the air instead of falling over. Right. They try to play it up like it's something badass like that, but it's not. This The Huntsman has nothing on Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. <laughs> We reference that movie a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, okay, um, I wanted to make this point actually before I started, but now that we're eight and a half minutes in, I'm just now thinking to say this. Um, I'm going to continue, I'm going to further go into this. Don't worry, because when people say this, it's typically seen as a lazy criticism, and it's typically something people don't elaborate on after they say it. I promise I will do my best to elaborate, but I just want to make one thing extremely clear about this movie before I say anything else. This movie is astonishingly boring. Oh, yeah. Holy fucking shit, this movie is boring. <laughs> it really is. It's, almost, it's unbelievable how boring this movie is. <laughs> like, I, um, I took a bathroom break for 30 seconds right. in the middle of it. And I was, I, I was sitting there and I was washing my hands and I caught my reflection in the mirror. And I just kind of had to tell myself, holy shit. How fucking boring is this? I, had to leave. I could not believe it. Okay, now that that is out of the way, <laughs> um, I will continue. Um, this is and it's one of those cases where um, it's really it kind of felt like um, what do you even call this genre? Uh, um, I'm not quite sure. It's a period piece with battle sequences. And it tries to be funny in places. It's like the Seinfeld version of that. 
It is about, for the longest time, it's about nothing. Yeah. They, they just need to go get the mirror. And with about 45 minutes left, they get the mirror. Nope. <laughs> I just Credits. expect it. <laughs> Please. It's like, it's, like, um, it's like Emily Blunt will say something, and then she'll be like, I, you know, the I'm, yes, I am this character, and I'm just kind of talking to my sister. And then I expected to hear the, the little Seinfeld thing play that shows the scene transitions. And we get those exterior shots. Only in this movie, the exterior shots are these really, really fake-looking, cartoony places. And maybe maybe that's just the fact that we saw the Jungle Book last week. Right. When all the CGI was flawless. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, not the case here. No. Not in any way whatsoever. Um, so, not, not, not only do those exterior shots look fake, by the way, um, but we also get some CGI monsters here, too, that aren't... Uh, Aren't exactly. I don't even know what the fuck those things were supposed to be. And then, and then they fight those things off. But another thing that makes it even worse is they went through the trouble for some reason to. I think I actually remember this in the, from the first movie too. But um, when we're looking at these fake ass sets for the outdoor scenes, outdoor scenes, the the um. Soundstage scenes, excuse me. <laughs> the green screen soundstage scenes. Um, they went through the trouble of putting these little creatures in the forest. Just like these tiny little dudes that just kind of curl around. And these little bugs that fly around. Um, that, I believe, was supposed to kind of bring on the immersion a little more of the forest and stuff like that. But that, those little creatures, every time they were there, were kind of making the really fake-looking forest look even more fucking fake. <laughs> it's like, it made the fakeness stand out even more. The, the weird, like, shrubbery on the turtle, and... Mm -hmm. Just so weird. The creatures Just in the were, foreground, for no reason. They're so, the creatures were so bizarre. And, like, the red squirrels. And then, um... There's a lot of problems I had with, um... These movies apparently are set in the X-Men world. <laughs> there is absolutely no suspense or surprises whatsoever because for some reason the people in this universe do not stay fucking dead after they are supposedly dead. Nope. So here's here's what it is. is um, we have our main cast here. We have Hemsworth, Emily Blunt, Charlize, and Chastain. We already know that these are our four main people. Right. When you introduce Chastain at the beginning... And she's been in the movie for less than three minutes, and you kill her? Do you think you're fooling us? I mean, yeah, there's the Julianne Moore argument, but the Huntsman Winter's War, believe it or not, is not Children of Men. <laughs> Chalk <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so, I gotta tell you how incredibly shocked I was when they're there. And they're, like, defenseless in the forest. And then a hooded person that we don't know. A real, real mystery person hiding their identity comes in and saves the day. And then slowly pulls their hood back in a dramatic reveal. I was truly and completely shocked. The Jessica Chastain returned after three minutes in the opening. And then they, and then there's, and then they, they do that thing. This happens in like, I think the only reason they put it in here is because it happens in every movie ever. Like it had no purpose. And that was, what do you think? You can, pro like if I pulled up the scene enough, you can probably tell me what happens before I say it. Even though it has no bearing on anything whatsoever. Okay, so, um, Mystery Chastain swoops in and fights off whatever it is that they were fighting. Um, and then Hemsworth is like, they're like, whoa, I was just saved by this person. Who could it possibly be? And then there's the dramatic Chastain reveal, and he's like, Chastain, you? But you're dead. And what do you think she does? Yeah, for some reason, she knocks him the fuck out. Yeah, what was the point of that? Um, and then he wakes up, and he's at her place, and they're all like, yeah, yeah, I'm this person, and yeah, yeah, you're that person. And it's, it's not like she was hiding where she was. 
Which is literally the only reason I could think of that she would do that. Because <laughs> um, they weren't enemies. She knew they weren't enemies. But it all doesn't matter anyway. Because um, she, her character only exists so that Hemsworth can have sex scenes. Yeah. Because that's the whole reason making Knotson to begin with. Because women love looking at Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so, so let's get the two-time Oscar nominee. To just be his little sex life. <laughs> um, so anyway, that just happens to be good at battle because, oh, women surprising or something. We're supposed to go like, oh, that fighting's for men. This is absurd or some bullshit. Um, but <laughs> Are you annoyed by the way they shot the battle sequences? It just, it's just, that's just what they all look like now. My God, it was going in like super fast motion. Remember, like we live in a world where Alice in Wonderland has battle scenes. Oh God, so yeah, don't remind me about a, that horrible movie coming. You know, because they basically took, they basically took the armor straight off of Mia Wasikowska's body and put it on Kristen Stewart two years later. Yeah, oh my God, that's a good point. <laughs> so anyway, um, so he and Chastain will get along because Chastain's like, um, she, he's like, Emily Blunt made it look like you died, but you didn't actually die, but I totally thought you died. And she's like, oh yeah, well, I felt like you abandoned me. I didn't, I didn't know you thought I was dead, but now that I know you thought I was dead, I'm still pissed off for no damn reason because the movie needs conflict. And then she goes and she pouts, and then he's like, oh, look at me, I'm Chris Hemsworth. And she's like, yeah, I know, but I don't remember our time together. Like, that person, well, I wrote down her exact line, and but it was too sloppy to see. Um, that person I once was, I don't even remember what it's like to be her. It's just all gone. Ten seconds later, they're fucking. Yeah. After her big point of, I don't even remember my past life. Uh, well, you're Chris Hemsworth. Why not? Boom. <laughs> so, so that's just in there. Just because. Because the movie needs to be doing something. Because most of the time it's not. And the dwarves, um, only two of them come back. Because there's nobody else gave a fuck, I guess. And like I said, we don't have Bob Hoskins anymore, sadly. Um, so they just bring back Rob Bryan and Nick Frost. The two comedians. Go figure. What do you think they're here for? They try. They really do try to bring the humor. And we know, obviously, as moviegoers and more, um, that Nick Frost and Rob Bryan can Bryden can indeed provide that. Correct. Normally. And they do. They really try. Those deliveries, it's like, oh my god, there was... Almost something funny there. It was so close. It was so close. Um, but it never happened. Like, not even once. Um, yeah. So, um, long story short, um, when the movie's not ripping off stuff, or being totally and completely pointless, or being just any other thing, it's just a complete com and total dull... Just mind numbing nothingness. It's just nothing is going on here. This movie should not have been made. I really. They clearly did not have any specific idea when they dove into this. <laughs> they just knew it was going to involve the mayor, and for somehow, somehow, some way, it was going to be two hours. <laughs> um, and Frozen's popular. Let's do it. Yep. Okay. I know you've practically made a transition, but even so, you have to point out that Universal just said, Hey, Disney, can I have that? <laughs> yeah, <no. clears throat> Sometimes we make mistakes. <laughs> so, this movie made me bored with Liam Mason. This movie is so boring and so wrong-headed, it made me say, Why are you still here, Liam Mason, multiple times? <laughs> That's... That's not the way Liam Neeson works. <laughs> you better wish it was like a Mel Brooks movie so something would happen to him. <laughs> the narrator. Uh, Alright, did I miss anything? It's it's just boring. It I hope it doesn't make much money. I don't think it's gonna do very well in the box office. This, this uh, I don't I don't really remember how the first one did. I, I don't think it didn't fail, obviously. It did enough in order to justify a sequel. Lately, I guess. lately anymore, I don't know. Because yeah. sometimes they just say, fuck it, even though we didn't make money, let's do it anyway. So we made $15. <laughs> $15 more than we thought we would. Okay, fine, let's green light a sequel. Ladies love them Chris Hemsworth. That's, <laughs> that's what we take away from this. They're going to have a lot of Hemsworth. This movie makes it in theaters long enough to see Civil War. <laughs> 
In some theaters, it won't. I didn't even put together until just now. Um, it was like, I always say how much Liam should be jealous of Chris, but apparently Chris was watching Hunger Games and was like, hey, Liam gets the bow and arrow girl. I want my own bow and arrow girl. He didn't even fucking get her, by the way. Nope. nope. <laughs> okay, so. No um, patents for you. All right, um, let's just move on quickly. This will probably be real quick. Um, our next one and last one is a movie called Mr. Right. I think this was at last year's TIFF. Sounds right. Um, and it's a romantic comedy action... Romantic dark comedy action movie starring Sam Rockwell and Anna Kendrick and Tim Roth, and it's written by Max Landis. Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Not quite. It's more like, uh, well, I'll get into it, and then we'll get into comparisons. Right on. Um, Sam Rockwell is a hitman who dances around with a clown nose on and kills people huh. for a living. He's, yeah, that's what he does. And my first, my first thought, I had heard nothing but bad things about the movie when I went into it. Like, right before I went into it, too, somebody was telling me, oh my god, this is just... Oh. All, she, all she said was, I want this movie to fuck off. That's all she said. Oh, God. <laughs> and that was, like, right before I went into it. I was like, great. That's wonderful. Um, and then there was another dude who is typically, like, pretty easy to please. He's one of those guys that if he's just in front of something, he'll probably enjoy it just because it's a movie. Yeah, right. Um, and he told me he turned it off after ten minutes. That's not good. So, I was like, oh, my God. So, I mean, because, yes. well, that's the thing, though. Um, Max Landis was the writer. Yes. And a lot of people like to attack him. Um, and his most recent movie, I think, was... No, he had two movies, like, almost right together. American Al He wrote American Ultra and Victor Frankenstein, I think, was his as well. Mm. Um, and I got a kick out of those. Oh, yeah. So I'm, so I'm used to defending him, you know. And I'm defending Chronicle to you all the time. Yeah, I know. I don't know why, I just didn't think it. Um, so I was like, okay, it's probably just a movie a lot of people hate that I'll think is fine. Right. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, Rockwell goes into a convenience store, and he's just, and I'm thinking, you know, well, regardless of how bad this is gonna be, they at least got one thing right, and the very first thing it starts off with is Sam Rockwell dancing. Hmm. It's like, if you're gonna put Sam Rockwell in your movie, yes, he's gotta do that at least once. Right. They actually end up making a character trait, so it must have been, like, either written for him, or he just kinda scored that. But, <laughs> um, and then he's in a convenience store, and he meets Anna Kendrick, and Anna Kendrick is this, I don't... I guess the idea is she's a rebel. I don't know. The very opening of the movie before anything happens is like a whole movie of kids in a classroom and they're each saying what they want to be. And when it gets to her, she says, I want to be a T-Rex! And she starts like, arring into the camera and then boom, she's Anna Kendrick 23 years later. That's how it starts. <laughs> That sounds, that sounds about right. <laughs> and, um, and then they meet, and they fall in love. And he's basically, he's right out in the open of the fact that he's a hitman, but she kind of just takes it as he's fucking around, until she learns he's actually a hitman and witnesses it. Um, and he's being chased by his past, um, mainly by Tim Roth. And for a large portion of the movie, we have no idea if Tim Roth is an ally or a foe. Um, and you don't really care enough to think too much about it anyway. Well, that's not good. So, anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. So, um, okay. Um, for starters, um, the main issue with this movie, I know I'm just, I'm, I'm flip-flopping back and forth so much when I talk about this, but, um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about Kendrick. Because I, 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 it's been made clear how, how I feel about this Pitch Perfect movies, and it's not positive in any way, shape, or form. Um, but there's just something about her in, like, especially in the, her indie movies, like, um, when she, uh, Digging for Fire, she had a really small part in, um, but I really liked her in it. Um, and there are times, where there was something just recently where I was talking about how she's kind of, she, um, the last five years, um, I really liked her in, though. Um, and so, so she's kind of, because there, there was a point there where I didn't like her at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I saw a few more movies, um, that were, that were right for her. And I started, okay, I get the appeal now. 
Um, but here we've kind of gone into a relapse, and it's kind of like um, her char her character. I'm gonna say honestly, I'm gonna say it's probably more the writing than it is her. I'm really not quite sure who to blame for this because. Her character is extremely... She's tr she's really trying. You know what I mean? Like, she's trying really hard. I'm gonna work with what she has. Like, Anne Hathaway in the 2012 award season times 150... Oh, boy. Thousand. <laughs> it's, it's... I know what you mean there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad. And the issue is that with the way she says the dialogue... I can't tell if it's really bad writing or really bad improv. <laughs> or if it's written like it's supposed to be really bad improv. I that's don't, more likely. I don't know. But uh, that's the issue, though, is I think we're supposed to find her all adorable and appealing. Um, Cody. <laughs> but, shit. No. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, I'm biased extremely towards her. Her character is as cringeworthy as the word adorable. <laughs> It's basically like, it's kind of like, if you go to like Anna Kendrick's Twitter or Instagram, and she were to do just these little cutesy things for like a second, and it would get all the reactions of, oh my gosh, she's so adorable! Imagine that, only instead of her doing it in tiny little snippets for her Twitter or Instagram, it's an entire character that she plays for a straight hour and a half. <laughs> Some people can just deal with that, I it's, guess. You have not seen this movie. That doesn't matter. You, <laughs> you know how biased I am. Dude, I told you, she was, she's really growing on me. And just this whole time I was watching this, I was like, wow, she needs to fucking stop it right now. This <laughs> the you know, I want I want to see her as, you know, like, oh, she's just being, you know, cutesy and stuff like that. But it's, like, to an extreme fault here. This, no. Stop. And then Rockwell. Um, we all want Rockwell to do well in his career. Right. Um, but the, some of the decisions he's making, he needs to... Well, I, I, you gotta be careful what you say, because you look at, like, Snow Angels... Which is like one of the most harrowing performances from him you'll ever see. That's a that's a dark, depressing movie, and he and Kay Beckinsale and everybody else in that movie just absolutely sell it. And David Gordon Green did that movie. Now it makes you say, "God, Rockwell, you need to start making better decisions. Go work with David Gordon Green again." Oh shit, Rockwell did work with David Gordon Green again, and it was The Sitter. <laughs> Mm. So anyway, um, another problem this movie has, apart from the main character, <laughs> is that this is a Max Landis movie. He did American Ultra. Right. I'm, I'm spe spe specifically singling out American Ultra here because American Ultra was this action comedy that was also R-rated. And they really pushed that R-rating because American Ultra was violent as fuck. Oh yeah. Um, and that's kind of what, that's kind of went with the movie, though. That was the tone. Mm -hmm. Um, this movie is also rated R, and it's about a hitman that has no problem just killing people left and right, and it's got criminals coming in from the woodwork and everywhere, and everybody's just killing everybody. He, there's a lot of scenes of him throwing knives. Everything I just told you about the hitman and the throwing knives and the fact that so many people die in this movie and the fact that it's rated R, pretty much all of the violence is PG-13 and all, and the R rating strictly comes from the language. Oh, that's horrible. It, that, yeah, it's, something's wrong, If you right? have the, the rating already, <laughs> just go for it. And that's the thing is, I'm not saying be excessive for the sake of being excessive, but with the way American Ultra was fun about it, and given the plot of the movie, how the movie is so silly about it, and that's the one compliment I give this movie, is the tone is not all over... The tone never changes. Okay. Like, with American Ultra, for instance, there was the comedy and there was the violence, and sometimes it would get serious, and you're not sure where it was. The movie never changes tone. Regardless of how many bodies pile up or how many people die violently, the movie never changes tone. It's always done in a comedic light. Right. Um, so with the fact that the movie stays comedic through the whole thing, 
it honestly probably would have added a little bit to the experience if the violence was really... The violence just really went for it. But they've been trying to get a PG-13 and they denied it the last minute. There's a lot of fucks in it. I think they went long past the fuck one. Okay. Um, that's another thing about Kendrick. Is that, um, her... <laughs> this isn't her fault, I guess. Um, it's another one of those cases where a lot of her dialogue has fuck in it in random places. Uh -huh. And you can tell that they think that's making her lines funnier. She has the Katherine Heigl syndrome. But it's not. Katherine Heigl's done that? They basically made her curse so she could be funny and it didn't work. No, it didn't. So, um... And then it takes the approach of... You think... The, you see the plot. Okay? Right. Where you have Rockwell as the hitman and she as the girlfriend. And eventually she's gonna learn that he's a hitman. And then you pretty much know where this is going to go. Um, eventually she's going to get kidnapped. And then there's going to be little comedic things about a normal girl being in this violent hitman world. Oh no. Cue sitcom music. <laughs> um, there's the moment when he talks, um, I think it's Riza at this point, um, is going to take her hostage. Uh, but then he comes in, he defuses the situation, and they fight him off, and then she's walking away, and she's... Since she's the innocent girl in this world, it's it's hilarious when she looks at Riza, this hardened hitman, and just says, Thank you for not taking me hostage! And then they walk off, and it's like, yeah. You know, you throw her into the hitman world, and the hitman world is suddenly all cutesy and shit. Hilarious. Um, and then there's the other plot point where the movie really loses steam. And this really would not have been the direction I've taken it. Um, it and that is um, that once she finds out, it really upsets her and she wants him to stop killing. So because he's a nice guy when he's not killing people and because he's faithful, you know, he's. I'm starting to realize just how much his character is like Mark Wahlberg in the big hit. I'm just... <laughs> wow. Okay, but anyway, um... So he vows that he's not gonna kill anybody anymore. Like, he'll wound them and he'll still do his job, uh, but he won't kill people, because he, she doesn't want him to. Right. And he's gonna stay faithful to that. So, um... N n now, of course, I think you know where this is gonna lead. Her character is gonna have an unexpected turn before this movie is over. That you won't see coming at all. Unless you've seen one goddamn movie in your life. Tim Roth, um, it's a good thing, it was a good thing he was in The Hateful Eight while it lasted, because right directly, The Hateful Eight's not even four months old. Boom, hardcore Henry in this. Yeah, that's not The fuck like... are you doing, man? Would you look at the scripts before you take them? <laughs> he just needs funny, I guess. Come on, man. You're better than this. Yeah, very much so. Well, 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 I know. He did that one... He did that one movie that's like one of the most hated movies ever recently. And he said... He he said it was just to make sure his kids got through college. That's Maybe he's still doing that. That's a fair point. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, I don't even know what he's doing here. He's, um, his act, his act, I was telling you about a weird accent. Mm -hmm. Um, that's actually kind of like in The Hateful Eight. He's, he's kind of using accents to show a couple sides of a character. Um, but. What is his accent this time around? It's like fucking Southern or something. What? It sounds weird. I don't know. I don't like it. It's like Tom Hiddleston. And, and then, and, and I saw the I saw the light. Yeah. It's like, what, my go-to example is Tay Diggs and New Best Friend. It's like, who who is going to buy Tay Diggs with a southern accent? Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, and then the rest of the guys, um, James Ransom is in this as well. He's one of the bad guys. He's, um, um, he's been in a lot of stuff, but most recently he was the pimp in Tangerine, which is probably where most people are going to know him from now. Um, and they're basically the bad guys in Super. Really? Yeah, that's, the ending was giving me... The raid at the end was giving me super vibes. And the guys themselves, too. Like, the one guy, um, I think, is even dressed exactly like Michael Rooker in <laughs> Super. Um, so, yeah, there was a promising premise here. And like I said, I've defended a lot of Max Lannis' work, but um, it just seems like at every turn, this script made the wrong decision. Uh... 
and in turn also the director did too. The only person that kind of comes out of it unscathed really to an extent is Rockwell. Because he's just kind of doing his thing. It's basically if his character in the Way Way Back killed people. That's it. Okay, cross the Way Way Back character with Billy from Seven Psychopaths. That's that's interesting. There you go. I actually like that idea. And and Melvin Smiley, Mark Wahlberg from the Big Hit. <laughs> um, so yep, yeah, that that was just Mr. Wright is all kinds of wrong. Oh God. The <laughs> end. Alrighty then, uh, some uh, star amounts real quick. Winter's War. One and a half. And Mr. Wright. One and a half. Alright. So it's another edition of AJ's Movie Reviews. Next week we have Mother's Day, Keanu, and Ratchet and Clank, as well as Midnight Special. I'm kind of excited about Keanu. <clears throat> I'm excited about Keanu too. <clears throat> uh, we have a brand new versus this week. Who knows what the nose that I'm talking about is. And uh, that's going to be coming up on Sunday. Uh, you're going to have to wait and see what's coming up on Saturday. we got a surprise for you guys, so that's coming. And uh, Gaming with Ash on Monday, Raw Podcast, 11.30 p.m. Monday night, Wednesday night, at tentatively 10 p.m. right now. But <clears throat> I won't be able to tell you that for sure for a couple more days, because we're starting late, because I may be watching a movie. just depends. And uh, Zazzle.com backslash Popcast Network for your merchandise. And uh, Facebook fan page, Zero and Disney Pop, Zero and Disney and Popcast Network. So with that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? That's it.